Thanks for joining us with episode 262 of the Clive Barker podcast. We appreciate you subscribing wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss an episode. Uh, Ryan and Jose talk about visiting the world of Aberat. There's a puzzle box for Nightbreed. And Hellraiser's Doug Bradley is reading stories on his own YouTube channel. Plus the audio version of Jose's article, Beyond the Limits, The Shaman, The Metaphysics of Light, Wisdom, and Sound. Uh, well, welcome. This is episode 262 of the Clive Barker Podcast. Uh, and I'm Ryan. And I'm Joe. Hi, guys. Hey. Um, so this is a short news episode. Well, I say short, but we haven't actually done it yet. So I guess we'll see. Uh, <laughs> but we just have a couple of things in the news to talk about. Um, uh-huh. I guess the first one is uh, National Geographic did an article about uh, otherworldly realms that you should visit. And we'll have mm-hmm. a link to that in the show notes, but Aberat was one of them, which was kind of nice. Oh, isn't that yeah. great? It's, it's nationalgeographic.com and it's part of their travel book club and uh it says explore otherworldly realms in these 13 fantastical tales yeah. and they talk about going through either meet thoughtful martians tour a utopian new york and escape to a mind-bending archipelago so you <laughs> yeah. know what we're talking about yeah and and the, that's a that's a Aberat is a great one for that because she's really a, a tourist you know she even gets an almanac to learn about where she and she travels amongst all the islands yep so that's pretty neat so, it's great to see people talking about Aberat and still getting excited about it because, you know, the last book came out in, what, 2011? Yeah, so yeah. it's been nine years since the last uh, Aberat book came out. That's a bigger and, gap even than between two and three. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully four and five will come soon. And uh, she writes this article, says, Fed up with her stifling life in Chicken Town, USA, a teen girl walks to the end of a pier jutting mysteriously into the prairie and accidentally summons a supernatural ocean that carries her to the world of Aberat, where each island is an unchanging hour of the day. This fantastical odyssey, part one of a yet-to-be-completed quintet, brings the archipelago to gleaming, eerie life with Barker's rich prose and vivid illustrations. So that's that's one of the places that she uh, she says we should explore. Um it's a great time to do that before you have to get back to work. Now the quarantine is being lifted. And um, Little Spark Films, it seems like they've been in our news a lot lately, uh, but they have released one of their Hellbound Lament uh, uh, commercial, semi-commercials for these, mm-hmm. uh, for these puzzle boxes, and so they did one for the Midian configuration, which is, you know, of course, based on Nightbreed. Uh, and it, we'll, we'll have a link to that, but it, it's pretty fun. Uh, it, the, the back, it gives the backstory of this, of why there would be a Nightbreed puzzle box, which is kind of neat. Yeah, they're not the first to try to come up with something like this. I know for a fact that other people have been, other box makers have been thinking about making a box for Midian and Nightbreed. But uh, it turns out that uh, this one was designed by Mike Montuori. And it was designed for Configuration Boxes, um, which is the website that belongs to Derek Neal. Yeah. Um, So the video shows a a night British-looking character, and she has these markings on her face that kind of resemble Cabal's markings, right? Uh, Yeah, she's like like the the child of Boone and Laurie. Okay, cool. And they use their magic to put all the night breed into this puzzle box. (laughs) What? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. All right. Yeah. I I'm not a, gonna. When they posted it, I put a little like picture of Ernest. And I said, "Hey, Vern, how'd you fit all them Nightbreed into that little box?" <laughs> ah, that's good. So I like mm. that it follows the director's cut. You know, where where uh, Lori Lori became Nightbreed at the end, so they could kind of shake it around and bug the bug the Nightbreed once in a while. So that's that's a, a really amazing. Uh, concept and the box is beautiful um i'm looking at the panels of the box right now in the commercial they really are beautiful a great design and the actress is uh pretty awesome in this i had a great makeup design uh she's kind of like just lurking around a building and she's just scared that someone might see her and uh you know it's a very detailed looking box yeah. and uh, kudos to little spark films for making another wonderful box video like this i think they have a plan to release a few more as the weeks go by yeah well and that'll be great to see and then our last thing doug bradley uh just advertised on facebook that they've they're starting their own he's starting his own youtube channel 
which is cool. Uh, the the first video, he starts reading Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Yeah, that's going to be something, huh? Uh, yeah. Read by Doug Bradley's wonderful voice. Yeah, it's great to see him doing better after his surgery. Um, and the the news about the tumor that he uh, had, yeah. and uh, I'm just glad to see him do more stuff. He's great. He's a great. Uh, uh, he's a great uh, uh, performer when it comes to audiobooks. I mean, he did Barbie Wilde's Venus Complex, yeah. right? Yeah, he read, and, and uh, Mr. Be Gone for Clive Barker. And Tonight Again that we had a chance to review. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's always great to see Doug using his voice and his talent to uh, entertain us. Well, and what's interesting, too, is in this video, he describes that Ever since he was little, he's always read his books out loud. He never reads like just in his head. He always he reads every book out loud. Sounds like a great practice. Yeah, yeah. So now he I mean that makes him super qualified. You know, if he's had he's been doing it for years and he's a and he's a uh, an accomplished actor. So yeah, of course. I think I remember. I think I remember Clive saying at some point that once he comes up with a draft for his books, he reads it out loud to see how it uh, how it sounds. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's a good way. And it also gives you a good uh, feeling for the flow of it because if you just read in your mind, you're reading f- probably 1.5x, you know, um, mm. times the, the actual speed of how it would come out in verbally. It's very awesome to have Doug Bradley create a channel. It's it's already got almost 2,000 subscribers. Yeah. Um, and the video was just put up a day ago. So, yeah. you know, this uh, actually, I am already subscribed. Look at that. Huh. Well, because you're, you're probably on the Clive Barker podcast channel. No, I'm actually in my own. Oh, I really? must have, uh, I must have done this when he announced it like a couple of weeks ago. Oh, so I must have okay. gone there. But now it's the first time he's uploading the video. So okay. he, he didn't even give it a title. It just says May 21, 2020. So, uh, yeah, in one day, he's got 2,000 subscribers and 2,000 views. So it seems like people are really dedicated when it comes to his channel. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, kudos to him. I'll be interested to see what he does. And he did those. Uh, he did that series of, of uh, audio books. Spine chillers. Spine chillers, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. He did that where he read some stories. And um, before that, he had done like this kind of – uh, audio book for some Lovecraftian story like The Stranger, something hmm. that was years ago. That was that was really a long time ago. Yeah. So, uh, click that subscribe button on the link to his video channel on the show notes, and you can also click on that little bell that's next to the subscribe button. You can pick to receive uh, all updates about his oh. channel, which is usually what I do, so I can yeah. get alerts about every single video. I'm I'm pretty ignorant about YouTube. We should do that too for the podcast feed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, that's cool. <clears throat> and uh, and coming up for next week, uh, the commentary for D D is for the Devil Rides Out. So we watched the the uh, the '60s Hammer horror film Devil Rides Out, and we just finished recording that. Uh, so that'll be coming out next weekend. And that was fun. something, something to look forward to. We had Ed join us for the commentary track, and we brought up a lot of trivia, a lot of stuff about uh, Satanism or the idea of Satanism from the sixties and seventies. Yeah, uh, Dennis Wheatley, the guy who wrote the book uh, that was adapted into the uh, the movie, and Hammer Hammer Films, of course, the studio that uh, produced it. So I think you guys will enjoy that, watching the movie and listening to our commentary track. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, We've got an interview coming up. Um, I don't want to say who yet, just in case it doesn't work out. But uh, And we'll be continuing the Imaginer series with Imaginer 7 and Imaginer 8 uh, to finish that up. And then Aberat 3, Absolute Midnight, we're looking at probably sometime in June. That's wonderful. I do have that audio book. I started listening to it. It's 15 hours. So, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I just put it on every once in a while and I listen to it on my Bluetooth headset. And I'm enjoying it so far. I'm really having a fun time with it. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I, I need to do that too. I want to look, see if I, I have that audio book already. Absolute Midnight on Amazon. Go get it because it's kind of hard to find a hardcover. It's, it's going for over 50 bucks right now on Amazon. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's out of print, I think. So you can only find it used. 
Oh. Uh, six yeah. used on Amazon right now for 53 bucks. Uh, one new from $98. Jeez. And two collectible from $150. But you can get the paperback for $9.99. What's the difference between new and collectible? Well, usually collectible is either someone who thinks that they have a very collectible book or they have an advanced uncorrected proof or they have a signed copy by the author. Oh, I, I see. That's the trick. with the, that, that always bugs me about buying stuff on Amazon like that because they don't use the actual photo of the, of the copy that, you're, you, you know, that you have. They, it's just some random. Sometimes yeah. there'll be a picture of the paperback and you, don't, you just don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, I don't like it when they use stock photos, but sometimes yeah. for the collectible, they do put a picture of the book. Like I'm looking at a collectible right now on Amazon. It says collectible like new, first edition signed by author, and he has two pictures of the book. So it does show the signature, the cover, and the back of the cover. So, well, But cool. most of them just don't put anything in there. Well, this was this was a short episode after all. Hey, so since this was a short episode, we're going to give you some more stuff to listen to. We have an audio version of a blog post that I did about light, wisdom, and sound, the painting. So here it goes. Beyond the Limits, The Shaman, The Metaphysics of Light, Wisdom, and Sound When the five bright wisdom lights are shining here, May recognition come without dread and without awe. When the divine bodies of the peaceful and the wrathful are shining here, may the assurance of fearlessness be obtained and the bardo be recognized. When by the power of evil karma, misery is being tasted, may the tutelary deities dissipate the misery. When the natural sound of reality is reverberating like a thousand thunders, may they be transmuted into the sounds of the six syllables. The Fourteenth Day, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. About twenty years ago, in May of 2000, I remember an article popped up in the old CliveBarker.com website, Lost Souls, about a large painting Clive Barker had made to decorate a New York City nightclub called Light, Wisdom, and Sound. This was old news at the time, as the event itself took place in the summer of 93, more precisely June 16th. The venue was located on New York City's Meatpacking District on 240 West 29th Street between 7th and 8th. The article went on to describe how Clive worked with three assistants to mix paints and such, completing this enormous piece in only two days, celebrating the opening of the club. Allen Ginsberg was also part of that night's event and chanted the Pradyaparamitardaya Sutra, the heart of the perfection of wisdom on stage at midnight to celebrate the occasion. Ginsberg chanted a slightly adapted version of the sutra he had worked on with Jalek Rinpoche, who would later perform the Buddhist ritual at Alan's death, based on a translation by Shunryu Suzuki with the Roshi's consent. Thanks to Jill Abrams, you can watch this reading uploaded to YouTube, here, part one, and here, part two. You can find out more about Ginsberg and the work he did with the Sutra here. The opening act featured YR, Young Richard, and the night's entertainment also featured DJ Anita Sarko. That article was the first time I found out about the event, and the 20 by 10 foot mural that Clive titled Shaman, the Metaphysics of Light, Wisdom, and Sound. The shaman part was later dropped for the sake of simplicity, however we'll use that term to describe the figure in the painting. A magnificent vision that decorated the VIP room of the nightclub on permanent display until the club closed its doors a few years later. Cheryl Benson, who wrote the article for Lost Souls, went on to describe the painting, offering some interpretation of it, and ended by saying that the metaphysics of light, wisdom, and sound needs a new home before anyone can view this spectacular piece again. It would be another six years before this painting would be seen again in a public setting. Lost Souls was, at the time, a Bent Dressler production, founded by Cheryl Benson and Stephen Dressler, two Clyde Barker fans who met through the pen pal section of the Dread fanzine. And the first time they met was in New York City, when Clyde was actually working on this painting. According to her personal Lost Souls website bio, I then found a small publication called Dread and decided to write to everyone on the pen pal page. Stephen was the only one who responded. Finally, I found someone else with the same obsession. 
After many letters, sometimes whole notebooks, we decided to meet on a weekend that Clive was going to be in New York City. We were lucky enough to spend that time with Clive, watching him paint, the metaphysics of light, wisdom, and sound mural. Together, we were instantly bonded. My obsession grew into total love and respect for this man called Clive Barker. Cheryl Benson, Lost Souls. The club was trendy and chic, a magnet for counterculture icons and the hip crowds of Manhattan. American psychologist and LSD guru, Timothy Leary, designed the programs for the venue. That location had previously been The Parallel, then Glamorama, and finally a pizzeria before being bought and redecorated by Peter Sibilia in industrial futuristic art deco, featuring Boz reliefs, 1940s propellers, a screening room, and art gallery. There were numerous events from raves. Some of the first U.S. jungle rave parties featuring NASA were spun at the club, to Sunday gay nights called Slurp, to special parties that could raise over $15,000 in one night to support LGBTQ nonprofits. And you could find artists or socialites like Debbie Harry or Suzanne Barscht there on occasion. Listening to a previous BarkerCast episode, friend of the show Ed Martinez, special effects artist and co-founder and editor of Cenobium, heard Ryan and me chatting about the Clive Barker Archives article about the metaphysics of light, wisdom, and sound posted back in February. And he and Nina Arlene immediately let us know Nina had attended the opening event back in 93, sending us some amazing photos from their own archives. We had them on the show recently in episode number 252. Here's an excerpt of her memory of that night. Make sure to listen to the episode to hear our entire conversation. Quote, Nina. It was a nightclub that opened up, and it was called Light, Wisdom, and Sound, and it, it was in what you would call the meatpacking district, like definitely a warehousey place, but that was chic back then, you know, to go to a nightclub where the entrance was... Not great. It was chic, saved a lot of money on decor that way. Ed, she was invited by Bess Cutler of Bess Cutler Gallery. Nina, yeah, it was uh, Bess and Herb. They invited a lot of people. It was, uh, the, the guest list was really awesome. Debbie Harry was on the guest list. Townsend was on the guest list, but he didn't come. Debbie wasn't at that event, but I did meet her and her little doggy earlier, at an earlier event at the gallery. She used to walk around with her little dog in her arms. You know, this is before the Hiltons, before people walked around with their dogs. It was very unusual. So Light, Wisdom, and Sound opened up a nightclub, and Clive's painting was going to be the backdrop of the stage, so it would sort of preside over the dance floor. They invited a lot of people that were doing fan publications and stuff like that, that were familiar and had been coming to his openings, art shows, things like that. Sort of, okay, these are the diehards. We had bagels before we had anything to drink. Oh, yeah, and we had someone's birthday cake, too. Nina Arlene, Barker Guest, episode 252. She met a photographer at the event, Victor Malafronte, the mad dog of New York's Wolfpack paparazzi, asked for his business card, and eventually got copies of some of the photos he had taken that night. These ended up published in an issue of Cenobium, covering the event and describing the painting unveiled that night. Nina also remembered that, as people hung out in the club... You could practically smell it, the painting. It was so fresh. Here are the pictures they sent us, featuring a lovely portrait of Clive and Allen Ginsberg I've never seen anywhere else before. Nina is wearing the lovely light dress, fifth from the left. The metaphysics of light, wisdom, and sound resurface briefly for an appearance on January 12, 2006 for Zoo Men, an event you may remember at the Burt Green Gallery where Clive performed a live painting and photography demonstration using five nude models, four men and one woman, as living canvases. After that, according to the February 18th blog post by the Clive Barker Archive, the painting went into storage and remained there for the better part of 14 years. Phil and Sarah Stokes go on to describe discovering the painting, feared lost in recent property moves. The photos show a vibrant, beautiful, loose canvas, unrolled to reveal a work of art that still draws as much attention as always. Quote, Neighbors stopped on the street as we unrolled it, startled by its sheer size and by the vivid colors which have not been dimmed by time, 
and Clive got to revisit his painting, astonished by its clarity and the imagery which has followed on into works which he has made many years later. Light, Wisdom, and Sound, Clive Barker Archive. The painting itself is 10 by 20 feet long, and from the photos the Clive Barker Archive included in their blog article, it looks as striking today as the day it was painted. At the time, excluding the scenic backdrops Clive had worked on during his theater years, this was his largest piece, and it might still be today. Even the beautiful moment triptych, depicting the entire Aberat archipelago, is composed of three huge canvases that make up an image 8 feet by 19 feet long. Using latex colors, Clive's landscape focuses on a figure, the shaman, that seems to be in a meditative state, in and of the world they inhabit. Tendrils of substance and light come out of their eyes, nose, and from eye stigmata on the palms of each hand. Are they creating this world? Are these tendrils new organs that take it in strange ways? These bulbous tendrils end in faces, their eyes glowing with sight, insight, (laughs) scanning the flat landscape. The ground is alive with green grass that is trying to envelop the shaman, rising up from the ground in reverential wisps around the egg he's sitting on. The egg is cracked, indicating the possibility of imminent birth, maybe a womb of sorts. The shaman squats on an egg and his feet merge into the ground. Going back to the many eyes that populate this painting, the Aitareya Upanishad, dealing with the nature of self and creation, says, The sun is believed to be Brahma, and the sun resides in the human eye. That person who is seen in the eye, he is the self. That is Brahma. Notice that this guy has no sun to speak of, despite being a wide-angle landscape. There is, however, a luminescence depicted by dots of yellow and orange floating around the shaman. Most Hindu and Buddhist entities are represented with closed eyes, as they usually are meditating, looking within. His form is surrounded by yellow, orange, and red dots of light, and pontillistic splashes of color that might as well be flower petals, spiraling in the air and around their body, as if summoned from thin air by the shaman. The seer sees not death, nor sickness, nor any distress. The seer sees only the all, obtains the all entirely. Chandogya Upanishad 726.2 Hume Translation The shaman is naked, his symmetrical body almost sexless. A flap between his legs, or an umbilical connection of sorts, appears to go inside the egg through a crack. The arms are stretched out, not resting on the knees. In Kundalini Yoga, the arms can be held out in the air during a Kriya, or meditation, making you engage your core, your fulcrum. In the distance, triangular structures like pyramids. Are they temples? Cities? The horizon is much, much lower than the eye line of the shaman, making the scale magical, disorienting. Are these very small? Or the shaman very large? Is the shaman at a summit, one of a thousand plateaus behind which we see the cut-off tips of pyramids far and below? We look up at the painting and let it take us in. Underneath the layer of paint depicting the egg the shaman is sitting on, Clive had originally painted a skull. By the time of the formation of the Bhagavad Gita, the term nirvana was used to describe the state of transcendence of both birth and death. Coincidence? Or was the creative process guiding him through a subconscious evolution of its own symbolism? The shaman's feet are literal roots that merge with the world, the root chakra being the keeper of karmic cycles and past lives. The painting is a snapshot of a moment that is an eternal present, all-encompassing, Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. The metaphysics of light, wisdom, and sound's composition comes together with one tendril face beaming light through its eyes on the right, another tendril face emerging on the left, displaying a trumpet-like mouth. The enlightened shaman appears to represent wisdom as an almond-shaped halo or a sacred flame floats over the sahasrara or crown chakra, like a mandorla or vesica pisces, 
connecting the shaman to the wisdom of the universe, the same shape also appearing as an opening over the anahata, the heart chakra, associated with love and how you move love through your life. A red circle can also be seen over the throat, a likely possible representation of the visuddha or throat chakra. What are love and wisdom worth without sound and the ability to communicate that wisdom to express that love? I find Allen Ginsberg's recitation of the heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra feels more relevant after looking at the metaphysics of light, wisdom, and sound this way. The sutra ends with a mantra. Gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisvaha. Gone, gone, gone entirely, gone to the other shore, awakened mind, svaha. Beyond the Limits is a blog feature series started by Rob Reidenauer. Special thanks to Ed Martinez, Nina Arlene, Phil and Sarah Stokes. Thanks for watching. It's a Saturday afternoon. I hope you guys are enjoying your weekend and uh, give us feedback. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel. Don't forget to download our app on the App Store and on the iTunes Store. Is that what you call it? Yeah, I don't know how long that app is going to last. I mean, it's not being we're. I think we're not paying for it anymore. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, it still works in my phone, so I guess all we're right. doing all right. Yeah. All right, and this podcast having no beginning will have no end. You can find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com. We've got an archive of past episodes, news, features, and reviews, along with all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on every other place you can find podcasts. Share your thoughts with us and share our podcast with your friends. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that's not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.
he turned to 